Classical management theory is like the great grandparent of organizational studies. We're going to look at the context at the time it emerged, the three primary theories that generally make it up, and talk about whether or not it's still relevant today. So first, let's look at the context at the time. This came about as a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, which is the late 1700s to late 1800s. Industry equals work. Revolution equals rapid change. Big changes in the way people worked. The rapid explosion of big factories. That's what was happening at the time. People were moving from farms to factories, from small shops to large companies. One of the main sparks or ingredients of the Industrial Revolution was power, steam power and hydropower specifically. The machines used to manufacture in these new large factories were run on power, not by hand. It's like the difference between a bicycle and a motorcycle. This sped up work dramatically and helped factories grow very quickly. There are also some machinery innovations inside of these factories. For example, in 1873, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Gin is just short for engine. It was a little apparatus that separated the seed from the cotton much more quickly than could be done by hand. And inventions and innovations like the cotton gin and other machines sped up work even further. Transportation was also booming at the time. That's another key ingredient of the Industrial Revolution. Like the railroads, they connected most cities in the U.S. by the mid-1800s. Steamboats started to catch on around 1800 as well, and the roads were improving in general. This rapidly changing context created a great need. The three ingredients, power, machinery, and transportation, came together to spark the Industrial Revolution. There were a lot of emerging issues at the time that people needed to grapple with. They were new. Large groups of people working together, people working alongside machinery. The pace of industry was speeding up very quickly, and companies were looking for more effective ways to handle their new challenges. These issues prompted a lot of new questions. For example, how are we going to organize all this? How are we going to maximize productivity with all these changes? And how are we going to manage all of these people working together? And we're going to look at three people that answered these questions pretty effectively at the time. Max Weber, Frederick Taylor, and Henry Fayol. In general, when we talk about these three guys, we're talking about the founding fathers of the classical management theory. And these are the three names you're going to see in most textbooks on the topic. So let's start with Max Weber. He's most known for the term bureaucracy, which to him meant the organizations should look like an extension of government and the legal system. He wanted a legal, rational approach to organizing. That meant that he didn't want to follow the traditional family-type system where the head of the family was in charge, or perhaps you had a charismatic type of leader. He thought these were not the right way to run large organizations, and he wanted a legal, rational approach where he saw each person's authority and should be tied to his or her official position in the organizational hierarchy. In other words, if you're in a job your responsibilities are tied to that position. And if you leave that job, you don't keep all that influence and power. Whoever the new person is, is responsible. So this was his way of balancing power and keeping things rational and organized. He wanted clear rules that governed performance and standardized guidelines for hiring and firing. So he was really concerned about issues of favoritism or what he called particularism. And he wanted to hire the best people to work in organizations and organize them in a logical, sensible way. Max Weber was a big picture type of thinker compared to the two others we'll look at today. And that big picture term is bureaucracy. Frederick Taylor also entered the discussion, and unlike Max Weber, who was very big picture, Frederick Taylor is much more micro in his focus. He used the term scientific management for his approach. To him, this meant applying science to work. Specifically, he thought that the customized approach was very inefficient. He saw a lot of factories and people basically all doing things their own way. However they wanted to do their particular job in that organization, they could. And he thought this was not efficient. This was not the best way to do jobs. So he said, let's do time and motion studies to study how much time every single little task should take and how many motions every single little task should take. And we can speed things up and come up with the one right Way. So each task was broken down into very small steps and standardized to the one right way. And so he would go into an organization, look at all the inefficiencies and figure out the one right way to do every single job. And his results were actually pretty impressive. For example, when he went into a bricklaying 
organization. They were laying brick down and they were bending over to pick them up. And he thought it was all very inefficient. So he came up with a system where the bricks were all right at hand level and they were up on a shelf and people didn't have to bend over to pick them up. And he made some other changes to their time and the way they use their motions. Then he sped it up about 300%. So now one bricklayer could put down as many bricks as it took three to do in the past. So his work was pretty dramatic and successful in some ways. So Max Weber took a big picture bureaucratic approach. Frederick Taylor took a micro level approach to looking at the specific tasks. And Henry Fayol, or Henri in the French, Fayol took a mid level approach. He was looking at the management side of things. How should we manage people? That was the big question that he wondered about. He put forward a theory of management called administrative science, or sometimes just called classical management. And he believed that managers needed to be trained in a much more systematic approach. He didn't really see any good theories out there for how we should train managers. And so he wanted to contribute to that discussion. In fact, he wrote, it is a case of setting it going, starting general discussion. That is what I am trying to do by publishing this survey. And I hope a management theory will emanate from it. So he wrote a book that then became popular in the late 1940s. In a section of that book, he talked about the management activities that managers should be pretty competent at. And this is a list that you'll see in many textbooks on the topic. He thought we needed good planning, that managers should look ahead and chart a course for the organization. He also thought that organization was a key management activity. They need to select and arrange people in an orderly and efficient fashion. He wanted the manager to be in command, in other words, to oversee, to lead, and to drive the process, but to stay out of the details. That was up for the regular workers. Managers should also be good at coordination, needed to harmonize and facilitate the general activities of different departments and groups in the overall organization. And lastly, control. The manager needed to ensure compliance on everything from accounting, finance, the technical side, quality control and other areas. Like I said, this is a list you're going to see in a lot of classical management sections of books when they talk about Henry Fail. In addition to the details we talked about for Weber, Taylor, and Fail, there are also some common elements that they really all wrote about in one way or another that bring them together. They all wanted a clear hierarchy in an organization, that chain of command. They all wanted some form of division of labor. They wanted a standardized approach to work. They wanted the centralization of authority, largely in the manager's hands. They wanted the separation of personal life from organizational. They all really wanted the best people in the right jobs, and that was one of the reasons why they wanted to separate personal life from organizational, so people didn't pay favorites. In other words, they wanted to select the best employees based upon qualifications and performance, and they also, by the way, wanted people paid fairly, at least in theory, Frederick Taylor and Henry Fail talked specifically about paying good employees, your best people, more so you can tra- attract and keep your best and most talented people. Henry Fail even talked about profit sharing, which was pretty innovative at the time. And I say at least in theory because not a lot of organizations necessarily took this advice, but these researchers did write about that. So Weber, Taylor, and Fail all come together to form a foundation of what we call classical management theory. And this is an approach you're going to see in a lot of textbooks because it really has become the great grandparent of organizational studies. Almost everything that comes after the classical management era is a reaction against it. So if you see human resources or human relations or systems theory or a team approach, these are all responses to or a reaction against classical management. And it's difficult to imagine an organization that's not influenced by this approach in one way or another, even today. So is it still relevant today? Well, absolutely. You see it in a lot of places, especially in manufacturing. And even though we might not think that manufacturing is still happening as much in the United States, it's absolutely still happening in the United States and all over the world. We have more than 7 billion people on the planet. We're still making a lot of things, and you still see this approach in a lot of manufacturing companies. You see it in warehouses and delivery services like Amazon. You see it certainly in food service. If you've ever worked in food service like fast food, then everything is really like a production line. Same thing with farming and food production. It's really gone almost to look just like a manufacturing 
process. And so a lot of ways, not only is it still relevant, it's still more common than ever. Now, of course, it is still only one way to do things. And some of the new knowledge-based, expertise-based, information-based companies don't necessarily take this approach. So Google, Facebook, and other kinds of companies like that are not generally manufacturing tangible goods. And so they do not take this classical management approach as much, although they are still very aware of it. And just like the theories we mentioned, like systems theory, human relations, human resources, they are in many ways reacting against the classical management way of doing things. So it's absolutely still relevant in many of our workplaces. And when it's not directly touching us, we are certainly indirectly influenced by it. So that's a little bit about the context at the time, the three primary theories that generally make up classical management theory. And we looked a little bit at whether or not it's still relevant today. And I believe it certainly is.